for those who are spiritually discerned all things, and they are themselves subject to no one else's scrutiny. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the fifth chapter. Jesus said, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and gives it light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to God the Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, Until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. So there, is, uh, there are three fictional characters who are pretty universally understood to be the most recognized fictional characters in the world. Any guesses on who any of those three are? Mickey Mouse is one of them. Any guess on the other two? Huh? I hear lots of options. Uh, the, the other two are Superman and Ronald McDonald. Now, what I think is interesting is that two of those are, are mascots, right? Mickey Mouse and Ronald McDonald. Uh, Ronald McDonald probably won't be on the list much longer since he's, uh, they're using him less to sell hamburgers these days. And, and Mickey Mouse, is uh, his character kind of changes depending on what the cartoon needs him to do. What I find interesting about one of those, what I find interesting about Superman, is that not just the character itself, but his character is pretty well known. What I mean by that is I think that most people don't just know who Superman is, they know a bit about him as well. For instance, most people probably will know what I'm talking about if I say, faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. Or if I said, what are the three things that Superman stands for? I think most people would probably be able to come up with truth, justice, and the American way. Ding. That the last couple Superman movies have not gone very well. Uh, You know, I think there was a lot of expectations about them, especially since it seems there's billions of dollars to be made by making superhero movies these days. But the last couple movies didn't go well. And I think the reason for that is that they lost track of who the character was. What I mean by that is uh, that there's a couple things that Superman always does, uh, you know, in, in living up to that truth, justice, and the American way. For instance, he never really hurts the, the villains. He never kills any of the bad guys, right? Lex Luthor can can make, you know, however many doomsday devices he wants, 
and Superman's always going to stop him. He's always going to put him in prison. Lex Luthor's going to break out, and then they do the whole thing over again, right? But Superman will never kill someone. The other thing that Superman uh, tends to do is it, one of the most common things that comes up in these comic books is that he'll have the upper hand on the bad guy, but some civilians will be in danger. And Superman will always give up the upper hand against the bad guy to go and help the civilians, and, uh, and then he'll, he'll have to go back to stopping the bad guy again. Well, in the last movie, they ignored all of that. In, in the last series of, of movies, they ignored all that. For instance, uh, um, in the one of them, the, the big climactic battle is happening, and it's in Metropolis, and there's cars flipping over, and buses being smashed, and buildings being damaged. And Superman doesn't stop to help any of those civilians. And the whole time people were watching, kind of going, shouldn't Superman be doing something here? He's Superman. And then the, the thing that really turned a lot of people off is at the end, he finally gets the, the better of the bad guy, and he kills the villain. And a lot of people had the idea that, I don't know who this man is who's wearing his red underpants outside of his blue pants, but he's not Superman, because Superman doesn't act that way. In essence, what they were saying is Superman lost his saltiness. Because when, uh, when Jesus is talking about saltiness today, what he's saying is that core of our identity, that thing that makes us, us. Uh, what he means uh, as he's giving this example is that in those days, salt would be mixed with other minerals, but uh, if it got wet, then the salt would kind of melt away and all that would be left was the white powder. And you couldn't use it anymore for what you use salt for, for preserving food or for, uh, for seasoning food. And so they would just throw that white powder away. In other words, it lost the one thing it did. It lost its core identity. And so what's left? That's what Jesus is, is talking about when he uses this salt example. Superman stands for truth and justice in the American way. And if you take that, all you're left with is a guy with a cape and pajamas on who seems to be really strong. And so then Jesus goes in to start telling us what that identity looks like for us as Christians. He, he talks about the, the city on the hill, but when he really gets into it is when he starts talking about how he didn't come to abolish any of the law. He came to fulfill the law, and that those who follow the law will be great in heaven, and that those that don't and teach others not to will be the least in heaven. And so a lot of folks hear that and they think our core identity is people of Christ is people who follow the rules. But that gets a bit tricky because as we read through our gospel, Jesus isn't always so good at following the rules himself. For instance, one of the rules is that you shouldn't heal, you shouldn't cure on the Sabbath. And what does Jesus do when he comes across a paralyzed man on the Sabbath? He heals him. And one of the, one of the rules is that you're not to carry a burden on the Sabbath. You're not to carry a briefcase or a backpack. You're not to carry the groceries in from the car. And what does Jesus immediately tell that man who he healed to do? Tells him to pick up your mat and go. Pick up a burden and carry it out of here. And again, when Jesus and his disciples are uh, walking uh, from one ministry site to another, they, uh, they find some, some wheat as they're going through a field, and they take that wheat and they take a little bit of water and they rub the two together in their hands and make a little bit of like a cake sort of thing. Well, what are two of the rules? You shouldn't harvest on the Sabbath and you shouldn't prepare food on the Sabbath. So them taking that grain and then preparing it by mixing it with that water and rubbing it between their hands, those are against the rules too. And so today in our lesson, Jesus says, I'm here not to abolish the law, to put, but to fulfill it. But in other instances, we see that he doesn't follow the law as other people expect him to. And so what it comes down to is that Jesus did come to fulfill the law. And what that means is he came to fulfill the spirit that God gave us that law for. To love God and to love your neighbor. If you look at those examples where the Pharisees got together and said, see, he's breaking the law. If you look at all of those examples... He's always choosing the option that shows love for God and neighbor. For instance, with that paralyzed man, you're, you're left with the question of, 
What, lo- what shows God's love better? What shows our neighbor love better? To let him be sick for another day or to heal him right now and show the power and the glory of God? Jesus chose to heal him right now and to show the power and the glory of God. Or in that example of them walking through the field, the, the way people would, uh, would manage not being able to harvest or prepare is they'd have to take the day before to do those things. They'd have to take, an ex- they'd have to take a bit of time out to prepare food for that day and to make sure that they were set. So Jesus had the question of what shows love and God's love and love for our neighbor more? To take time out from ministry, to prepare food, to, to not preach on that day so that you're ready for the Sabbath, or to preach every single day, finding food and opportunity along the way because God's love and God's message was too important to take time out. That's the option that they chose. In every, in every time Jesus is left with some option, whenever the Pharisees are saying, see, he didn't do what's expected, in all of those instances, he's choosing the option that shows love to neighbor and shows love to God, that shows the glory of God, which best shows love to God and neighbor. Today's reading always reminds me of a conversation I had with someone um, when I was in seminary, particularly that part that uh, if you don't follow the rules and you teach others to not follow the rules, then you're least in heaven. Because one of the seminarians I was going uh, through school with, she got that She had someone say, you're leading people down the wrong path because you're breaking the rules and teaching others to do so because you're a woman and women are supposed to be quiet in church. (laughs) That's a question that we had to answer, wasn't it? Because that is what the rule says. But of course, as we look around this congregation, we are blessed to have women who are anything but quiet in church. Right? And it's... (laughs) There is no shortage of women here who are more than happy to share their opinion of where God is in this world and in their life, right? We have people who who represent leaders of Welka. We have people who represent leaders of our music and deacons and readers and all those things, council members. And how much better is our church because those women share where God is in their life and in this world? They help us to better love God and our neighbor with their witness to the gospel. It's not about following, well, women are supposed to be quiet in church. It's about following, how do I show love to God and neighbor? And we as a church answered that question with, everyone should be free to share their voice in this sanctuary and help us to see where God is in their life. And so that's how we answer these questions. Whenever a challenge comes up, whenever some question comes up of how do we proceed from here, we ask, how do we love God and how do we love our neighbor? As I said before, people were pretty perturbed about the way Superman acted in that movie. And it pointed to the fact that Superman is about more than capes. He's about more than tights. He's about more than running really fast and flying really high and having bullets bounce off of him. When it comes down to it, Superman is about truth, justice, and the American way. And the same is true for us. Christians are more than our churches. We're more than our stained glass windows and our fancy fonts printed in our Bibles and our church slacks and our fancy hats on Easter. We are more than all of those things. We are people who love God and love our neighbor. And that is where our saltiness lies. That is where we find our identity. That is what it means to be the salt of the earth. That is what it means to be the city on the hill. That is what it means to be God's light in this world. And so in all things, love God. Love your neighbor. Never lose that bit of your identity. Stay salty. Amen.
Let us confess our faith in God in whom we find our identity with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Trusting that God hears us, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Holy God, it is your desire that all people might come to know you intimately. Lead our communities into deeper relationship with you. May your church radiate your righteousness to all whom we encounter. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of creation, you quench the dry ground, bringing water that sustains life. Satisfy the needs of the earth so that all living things bear witness to your verdant grace and continue to shout your praise. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of glory, during your time here on earth, you were crucified by powerful rulers who did not understand you. Grant leaders in our day wisdom and discernment that they may recognize you in the lives of the people they serve. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of justice, you free us from the oppression that binds us and exhort us to, to serve one another. Liberate us from all fear, bigotry, and greed, and set our hearts and minds on love, equality, and justice. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of life, you reveal your saving love to us through the power of your Spirit. Bless those among us who are preparing to encounter your invigorating will in a new way. Especially, Lord, we pray for those on our prayer list. For Robert, Katie, Hannah, Dante, Tanya, Lynn T., Bob, the family and friends of Brenda, Lee Wildridge, and family. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of all eternity, we give you thanks for the lives of the saints who have pointed us towards faithfulness in you. May we trust in your endless mercy and grace. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Confident that you are able to accomplish more than we even dare to ask, we bring these prayers before you, believing in your saving grace, revealed in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please rise. One of my favorite parts of the service here is when we get to pass the peace. It's one of those opportunities to show that love to God and neighbor as we put everything else aside and share a sign of peace with one another. That's part of the ministry that you see in front of you with the prayer shawls that are laid over the rail here. In these prayer shawls, we share that peace with people in our community who are grieving, who are being baptized, who are in need in some sort of way. And we're able to take that same uh, sentiment that we share as we pass the peace with one another and send that home with others to know that our love and God's love is with them. Will you pray with me as we bless these prayer shells? Gracious God, we ask that your love and grace be with those who receive these prayer shells. May they find in them a sign of your love, our love, and may th those who receive these find peace and comfort. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you. Let's share it.